This is One on One. One on One is pleased to welcome Jonathan Carr, president and publisher, Simon and Schuster Adult Publishing. Good to see you. Good to see you. Let's uh, disclose some things. Okay. We got history. Yes, we do. Go back a couple of years. Uh, a couple of decades, I think. Yeah. Um, your dad. Um, Donald M. Karp. Don Karp believed in what we were doing in public broadcasting before we even got to public broadcasting. We had an idea, long story short, to disclose his bank. He was the president of a major bank on Jersey side, and he decided to underwrite what we were doing, and that's how I got to know you. He was the uh, chairman and the CEO of Broad National Bank, and um, the best father any son could ever have. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's so funny because I've worked with so many authors through the years, mm -hmm. politicians, businessmen, um, artists, and my dad has the best judgment of any of them. Um, he was someone a lot of us uh, sought for advice. And by the way, could you put, that, put up that picture again of Jonathan? No, they got it. Okay. That was us back in the day before you were the Jonathan <laughs> Carpet, Simon & Schuster. Your love of books started when and because of what? Well, probably started with them. I mean, my, my parents, uh, my mom, Marjorie Carp, um, uh, is, uh, was a teacher for 25 years. And uh, there were always books in the house, and we were always talking about them. I remember, uh, I think probably uh, the, my, some of my first memories were my dad watching the Watergate hearings mm. when I was about eight years old. And we still have all those books by John Dean and H.R. Haldeman. And, That's right. And um, so I was always interested in, in nonfiction and in politics. Um, I think I got my first job because my mom had uh, given me a book called Loose Change by Sarah Davidson. And uh, it was a book about sort of coming of age in the 1960s. And when I went in for my job interview at Random House, I saw that book on the shelf of my boss, Kate Medina. And because I'd read that book, she hired me. So I probably owe it all to my mom. And actually, to this day, um, if my mom loves a Simon & Schuster book, it's usually a hit. She's got a real She has a good sense. eye. So you just triggered something. Um, in this incredibly digital world, the revolution has taken or whatever. Some people believe that either books are dead or they're dying or, eh, what's the audience? You believe the opposite. I do. I think that the, uh, certainly it's a more crowded media environment than ever before, whether it's streaming video or podcasts. Um, there, there, is more, there are more places to go to be entertained or to get information. But there's something about a book that is elemental. Um, it is straight on what one person thinks. And when it's distilled to the very best, and, and, when it's, and when it's a writer who has real credibility and authority, and who's really thought about it, yeah. there's nothing like it. And there's also nothing like, I, I disclosed our relationship before because I knew you quote when you were a kid, which makes me feel really old. Um, but it was Simon & Schuster I, uh, in 2002 that, um, that published my first book. From the heart. Uh, it's Hill. still on our backlist. Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing like that experience of a prominent editor, publisher, someone in your world saying, yeah, we'll take a shot on you. What are you look for. By the way, before you did this, you did the 12 books. Um, right. I, I remember every, every month waiting for them to come. Are there certain things you're looking for? Because you've done Howard Stern. You've done, uh, let's go through some of the other. John uh, Irving, Bruce Springsteen. Oh, yeah, him. Susan uh, Orlean. Uh, all different. Yeah. What are the keys to a successful book? Well, I think authority, passion, obsession, um, uh, you know, determination to get it right. Um, it, it, uh, certainly craftsmanship. I mean, John Irving writes draft after draft after draft. And, um, and, and the really great writers, it doesn't matter whether it's their first book or their 10th their book, they are, they're in it all the way. And they're completely committed to it. There's a conviction about it. I think that, that you can look at a book a couple of different ways. Uh, imagine you're, um, you're in a saloon. And uh, there's a stranger um, next to you um, on a stool. And they say, I've got a story to tell you. Uh, well, a book is that person on the stool. And, and the question is, do you want to listen to that person for 10 hours? Um, because that's how long it's going to probably take you to read the book. So sometimes you need somebody who's just got a great story who can keep you captivated mm. for a really long time. Then there are other people who walk into the bar, and you know them, and you like them. And you just listen to them because you're along for the ride. And you want the story to end quickly. So I don't have to keep listening. Sometimes. What was it like? Uh, we had Beth Stern here. Check out um, our catalog on steveautobato.org. She was terrific. Howard, interesting to work with? Howard was a joy. 
Um, you were great on his serious show, by the way, talking about thank it. Thank you. Well, Howard, you know, like actually, like a lot of the authors I've worked with who were really successful, he he was he was deeply concerned about every aspect of the book. And he didn't want to let it go because he really wanted it to be right. And uh, he knew he wasn't going to, he probably isn't going to write another book. I hope he will. But if he doesn't, I won't be surprised because it's agony for him. So he and, said. And you know, what's interesting is that he doesn't think that when you're an entertainer, um, you should be enjoying it. It's all about the audience. It's all about um, making sure that you give them, um, you give them pleasure. And, and, and what's interesting to me about that is that he wasn't in it for his own enjoyment. It really was hard for him, but he really cared about the reader's experience. And he went through that book more than a dozen times, revising it so that the pacing would be right, so that the stories really cohered, mm. so that he was giving more of himself, um, that it wasn't just a book of interviews, but that it was as much about him. It actually turned out to really be an autobiography through conversation. I don't think people realize. The interviews he had with other yes, people. exactly. Yeah. So, and it was it was what the conversations meant to him. That's right. How they lingered in his mind, and what he learned from them. So, it really did become an autobiography through other people, which I thought was really, really wonderful. If you're listening on the audio side, this is Jonathan Carp from Simon and Schuster. Um, you worked with Hillary Clinton, and who's the other name? Uh, Donald Trump. <sighs> Different approaches to writing. Well, uh, yeah, they are a study in contrast. They both actually, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave that alone. Um, I, no, I, can, I can talk about it. So Hillary did Trump Clinton, really write a book? Um, well, I will tell you this. So Hillary Clinton um, Excuse me, was, President Trump, I apologize. Well, he, he, Hillary was, uh, was deeply committed in every aspect of it. She, every word she reviewed, she thought about. Um, she was careful, she was meticulous, it was all fact-checked. Donald actually uh, called me from the airplane to dictate a chapter. Um, it was a chapter I asked him to write. It was called The Art of the Hair. Um, this, was, this, was, this was like 16 years ago. This was when right. he was on The Apprentice. It was his first season of The Apprentice. And we thought that it would be a fun book to publish. It was called How to Get Rich. I wanted to call it, he had a sign on his desk that said, the buck starts here. And I thought that would be a better title. And he said, no, no, we're calling it How to Get Rich. And then he said, How to Get Rich. That's what people want to know. Um, and I actually wrote the first sentence of Donald's book. Which um, is? Uh, uh, do not let the brevity of this book prevent you from appreciating its profundity. <laughs> um, and the reason I wrote that was because the book was so short that I, I wanted to you know, let readers know that there was a reason why it was short. It's short because it's profound. So then when he was running for president, you know, yes. 15 years later, I go into Politico and there was a list of the 100 Trumpiest things Donald Trump had ever said, and that was in the top 10. Jonathan Carp's quotes there. Thank you. I love it. Uh, listen, Jonathan, we appreciate the work you're doing, um, helping authors bring their work to a larger audience. For those of us who love books, are surrounded by books, um, and feel better when we're around books, um, thank you. Well, thank you. For what you're doing. It's great to and, see you. Um, and your dad and mom did real well. Thank you. So do you. I love them. Right. I'm Steve Adubato. This is a uh, one-on-one from the Tish WNET studio. We'll be right back after this. Stay with us. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by PSENG, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, PNC, Grow Up Great, Atlantic Health System, the New Jersey Education Association, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Rowan University. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly and by New Jersey Family Magazine and njfamily.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.